I had a chance to talk to uh, several of you in between, and it, it's sort of interesting. So much of what they said, I wanted to jump up and say, hey, hey, listen to me. This is what we did. I wrote a bill called the Drug Pusher Elimination Act. <laughs> How many members in the House do you think wouldn't go on that bill? Very, very few. And by the way, it was a good act, and it got through in pieces as it, as it went along. But you know, one of the things in the real practical world you're doing is, is get a good title. Get a good title to what you're doing, and you're, you're, you're partway there. Uh, I wrote a book called Political Rules of the Road. I spent uh, 20 years collecting rules of the political road from presidents, vice presidents, senators, house members, and so forth. And I had two rules of the road. They were two and a half rules, actually. The first rule was don't get in a squirt and match with the guy who buys his ink by the carload. The press, right? Don't get in a fight with the press. The second rule I now call the Tiger Woods rule is if you have to explain, you're in trouble. That works in Congress and it works at home, let me tell you that. And the third rule I have is part of a rule because I have so many women in my family. Uh, the third rule is never retreat, attack in a different direction. Um, my wife, who I hope isn't here, um, <laughs> came in about three or four months ago and said, well, I've had an accident in the car, and it's your fault. I'm sitting home watching a football game or something, and I, I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, if you'd have been on time, you'd have driven down there, and I wouldn't have gotten in the accident, and so you worry about it. So, I mean, you know, never, if you got a problem, and this is, by the way, when you look at the campaigns, uh, President Obama's campaign is just wonderful uh, at this and, and being able to handle that. If he has a problem, he just ignores and goes on, never tries to explain, goes in a different direction. Really, politically speaking, uh, it, these rules really work. And you can get it, the book at the library. Uh, there's one part of the book, and then we'll get back to this, that's uh, I, I'd just like briefly to talk about, and that's President Ford. Uh, you're talking about what's going on and throwing out people's names, and, and uh, President Ford came into office, obviously, with the, the Nixon res resignation on the 8th of August in, in 74. And uh, I was in the Republican leadership. I was a young guy, and I was the youngest one in the leadership. I'd been a prosecutor a little bit. And the issue when President Ford took over was not was he going to pardon Nixon. The issue was when he was going to pardon Nixon. And uh, I would have discussions with the president. Uh, when he'd get angry, he was sort of bald, you know, in the back, and you could see the red come up in his back of his neck. And you knew if it went too high, you were in deep trouble with the president, so you, so you backed off. But we had some very interesting discussions about the question of if, and President uh, Ford made a decision to pardon President Nixon 38 days after, 30 days after um, the uh, August uh, pardon, and he destroyed the Republican Party. Uh, and the party still has not rebounded from that. We lost 72 seats in the House, and uh, President Ford, before he died, wrote me uh, about four and a half pages of his rules and why. And uh, it was very interesting that uh, he said that they had, Nixon had to be pardoned, it had to be gotten over with, and we had to move on, and nothing would happen until he was pardoned. I agree with everything he said except, uh, except the date. So. Uh, what I guess I'm just sort of trying to say a little bit is when I listen to what we're talking about here, I wish we could have this kind of debates in the House now. I think we used to have those kind of debates. Uh, Tip O'Neill and President Reagan used to drink together a lot. It doesn't make any difference. They were together and they were talking. And I personally think that we're at a crossroads in our country, and I think we need everybody's help and participation. And by the way, why don't you talk just briefly, too, about the program you're doing with young kids? Oh, oh. is this working? Oh, excellent. Um, sure. The, uh, first of all, I want to say my colleague, Jeff Rosen, was supposed to be speaking here. Uh, um, I do have his remarks, and uh, let me just read you the beginning. He says, um, my remarks today simply to affirm uh, the importance of Professor Turley's scholarship on my own and, uh, and how I haven't a single independent thought uh, separate from his own writings and I'm guilty of plagiarism over and over again. Um, and so I, I thank him for those comments. And um, I, 
Uh, you know, we actually do have a, a, a civics program uh, that uh, we've been running out of uh, George Washington, the Congress Frey was referring to. Uh, it's going on for 10 years. It's actually a triple uh, murder trial. It's a double murder, an attempted murder trial based on uh, the um, uh, th Three Little Pig story where uh, Mr. B.B. Wolf is uh, um, being defended against a double murder, attempted murder claim. And we have elementary school students that are the jurors. But what's fascinating, besides the fact that it's a, it's a fun thing that the law students do, is I start out by talking about the Bill of Rights. And I ask them, what's in the Bill of Rights? And the, what we get back are absolutely uh, hilarious, including, you know, one person said, uh, the right to shop on the internet. Um, uh, but my favorite was, a, um, I, was I asked them to tell, put up their hands and this uh, little boy held up his hand and I said, what, what, is the, what right do you think is in the Bill of Rights? And he said, the right not to be bullied. And I said, that's the first correct answer. Uh, the Bill of Rights does have a right not to be bullied. It's actually contained in a lot of different rights. But the Bill of Rights is there to protect individuals uh, largely from their government. Uh, we don't need uh, a Bill of Rights to protect the government. And we don't need a Bill of Rights, by the way, to protect popular people. Uh, the First Amendment is there to protect unpopular people, to protect unpopular thoughts. And so it's a unique document. But, you know, that little kid was right. It's really about the right not to be bullied, not to be bullied by your government, not to be bullied by your neighbors, uh, to be able to be the person you want to be. And it's probably the most poignant thing I remember coming out of that program. Uh, but Nadine, maybe you have some things. Yeah, yeah. first of all, I, I want to uh, echo Jonathan in thanking the teachers. My most I, I had the fortune to go to some of the most prestigious colleges and, and law schools in this country, and I had excellent teachers there, but by far the best teachers and the ones that made the greatest difference in my life were uh, high school and below. And there's a, there's a um, sign in the New York City subway system that says, um, everybody can remember the name of his or her first grade teacher but I certainly don't remember the names of all of my law school professors. So uh, many, many thanks to, to all of you. And I, what I wanted to talk about briefly is um, students' rights and rights of young people. And one of the questions Jonathan got uh, after his fabulous talk um, was, was about that. So I like all of you, I see that you all have your own copies of the Constitution, and I urge you to read it. Don't, don't be afraid, first of all, don't necessarily accept what somebody else tells you about it. You've got to start the very important enterprise of reading it and understanding it on your own. Uh, the cases that Jonathan and I talked about, including the healthcare decision, we had nine really smart, really thoughtful, really well-educated justices, and no matter what else you think about them, I, all of them deserve those uh, adjectives from my perspective. And if they split five to four, over whether something is or is not constitutional, there are, as Jonathan said, there are very plausible arguments on both sides. So I think it's really, and Justice Kennedy in a landmark gay rights case a few years ago said something about the Constitution's broad provisions of liberty were broad guarantees of liberty, were deliberately written in open-ended language so that each generation could come forward with its own interpretation uh, and hopefully an expanding interpretation of what liberty means. So, uh, and Justice Scalia, to quote somebody with very different views, um, said in a recent case involving gun owners' rights, he said, you know, this was written, may not have been a very poetic language, as Jonathan said, but it was written in what was considered to be understandable vernacular language for the people of that day. And Scalia said, that's why when we ask a question about the meaning of this document, the first means to interpret it is common sense and plain meaning. So if you all take a look at um, Article 1 uh, at the beginning, this is, if you look at it, it doesn't contain subtitles, which I've always thought is an oversight, but it's a good exercise for students to go through. If you were to create your own subtitles, you'd look at Article 1, 
Um, it has to do with one of the three branches of government. So if you just, of the federal government, if you just look at the beginning language, you should all be able to tell me which branch of government does that deal with? Legislative. And then you go down to section two uh, and take a look at the second paragraph in section two because this has to do, I'm going to ask you to start thinking about what rights you have uh, no matter how old or young you are. So it says, no person shall be a representative who shall not have attained to the age of 25 years. Now, and you're probably familiar with that kind of provision. Now I want you to flip to the very back, which are the amendments, the first 10 amendments, of course, are known as the Bill of Rights. Uh, and I'm gonna- And by the way, in the stuff we've been doing uh, with Senator Graham and that, uh, the uh, people who took the test to become citizens uh, uh, only, and the, the people who didn't take the test, uh, something like 50 some percent of the people couldn't name the Bill of Rights. Well, there was a famous survey that was done, on, they had their 200th birthday um, a while back, and so the American Bar Association, the Lawyers Association, did uh, uh, a survey, and uh, uh, two thirds of people didn't know what it was, and then when they were told what it is, uh, most of them said, oh, let's get rid of that, <laughs> so, um, because it's seen as somewhat dangerous to have all these rights. But now take a look at the Fifth Amendment, which is a very important one, including, uh, it's, got, uh, it's got some introductory language which we'll read together, and then I'm gonna to flip to the end to some a very important open-ended phrase that you've probably heard before. So the Fifth Amendment starts by saying, no person shall, and then you flip to the end, be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, and that's the so-called due process clause, and it's the one in which the Supreme Court has, uh, through which it has enforced unenumerated rights, such as the right to choose an abortion, the right to same-sex intimacy, uh, the right to uh, choose your, live with your own family members, and so forth. If you, since it's such a large group, I don't know how I'm gonna do this, but I hope that all of you would be able to make an argument based on the difference between the language in the Fifth Amendment and the language in Article I, Section 2 about whether young people should have due process rights, right? Because here we have one of several provisions in the Constitution, the Article I provision that says, you have to be 25 years old before you can be, uh, you can succeed to Congressman Fry and be in the House of Representatives. But there is no age limitation in the Fifth Amendment rights. No person, literally all persons. And same if you look at the First Amendment uh, with the freedom of speech, this applies to Congress. It says Congress shall make no law. Uh, abridging the freedom of speech, among other things. And it's an absolute prohibition. It's not saying unless the law only applies to people who are under 18 uh, or who are in high school. Uh, so, not surprisingly, consistent with this plain language, the United States Supreme Court has always recognized that uh, you are entitled to fundamental constitutional rights even when you are a young person before the age of majority and even when you are in school, despite the fact that understandably for schools to fulfill their educational function, there have to be some limitations and some restrictions. But I wanna tell you about a couple of those landmark decisions because unfortunately, as in the area of federalism, as in other areas that we've all talked about, there has been some slippage but we need you to know that that slippage is not in the Constitution itself. And again, you know, not only is no provision in the Constitution self-enforcing, the principal founder of the ACLU said no fight for civil liberties ever stays won because there's like this um, momentum from government, no matter who, which party is in power, to increase its own power to reduce the rights of the states and of the people, if you're talking about the federal government. So each generation has to refight these battles over and over and over again. Uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, there were a lot of students, including middle school and high school students, who protested the war. Uh, one situation, uh, 
led to the very, uh, not the first, but a, an early important decision by the Supreme Court called Tinker versus Des Moines from Des Moines, Iowa, uh, uh, versus uh, Barnett. And um, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up with another case. Tinker versus Des Moines School District. And Mary Beth Tinker was a 13-year-old student in Des Moines, Iowa, whose family were Quakers. They were against the war, but she was went to school with some other students wearing black armbands to protest the war in Vietnam, but also to mourn the people, Vietnamese people as well as Americans, who had been killed there. And the school said, you know, this might lead to, it's such a controversial issue, and people have had family, students have had family members killed there. Uh, it might lead to disruption of the school, so we're going to stop them from wearing these armbands. The United States Supreme Court rejected that argument in a very strong opinion that had many quotable quotes, including, the Constitution does not stop at the schoolhouse gates. Neither students nor teachers, interestingly enough, had embraced the rights of teachers as well. That had not that often been uh, uh, expressly addressed. Uh, neither teachers nor students shed their precious freedoms, including freedoms of speech, uh, in the schoolhouse, and basically imposed a very strong burden of proof, similar to what I, I mentioned in uh, response to an earlier question, that the school could restrict speech rights if but only if necessary to prevent a dis material disruption to the educational process. But the fact that it was an un a controversial idea that might be disturbing to some students uh, is not enough of a justification to suppress it. And in that case, as well as an earlier case, the Barnett case, uh, the Supreme Court said, look, we're, the schools have no more important responsibility than to expose students to conflicting ideas and to get them to think and to wrestle and to debate and dissent. We're educating them for citizenship. We can't protect them from controversy. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court continues to pay lip service to Tinker, but it has really, really rolled back on free speech rights, most recently in a case uh, that is known as the bong hits for Jesus case. I'm not going to go into detail because I want to preserve time for questions, but if you're interested, you can ask me during questions. Uh, interestingly enough, the, there was a broad coalition including uh, many religious organizations. It was an ACLU case, many civil liberties organizations saying the school should not just because the school thinks that somebody might interpret that as a pro-drug message is not an enough of a justification to suppress it. Unfortunately, we lost by a split vote in the Supreme Court. And let me just mention one other um, big category of rights cases in the public schools where the law has not been as good as it should be uh, under the Constitution, and that is cases involving searches and seizures, which uh, uh, Pierre had asked about. If you take a look at the Fourth Amendment, I hope you all will, uh, it re Fourth Amendment, which governs this right, talks about the right of the people to be secure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, the Supreme Court has held Students are people, even when they're in schools, and they have protection against uh, uh, unwarranted, uh, suspicionless searches and seizures. Unfortunately, from the beginning, the court put students' uh, privacy rights on a lower plane, and it has continued to chip away especially in the context of uh, the war on drugs. And, 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 and um, so one point that I want to make, and it relates to this bong hits for Jesus case as well, the war on as a result of the war on drugs, every single one of our rights is less than it used to be. Because when a case involves drugs, we have too many justices who care so much about fighting the war on drugs that they will make exceptions to neutral constitutional principles they would otherwise enforce. So it's no coincidence that it was a perceived pro-drug message of students that led the Supreme Court to uphold censorship in schools. It's no coincidence that searches of students for who aren't even suspected, but you know, mass suspicionless drug testing has been upheld by the Supreme Court despite the Fourth Amendment. It's no coincidence 
arguments that justices who otherwise support federalism in the service of the, on the, of the war on drugs uh, want to increase the power of the federal government to enforce federal anti-drug laws, even in states that have embraced medical marijuana. So uh, along with the war on terrorism, it's something that has had a devastating impact on rights of young people, I, I, uh, among the rest of us. And I want to close my opening remarks here, and then we'll have some questions, uh, with one of, by quoting one of my very, very favorite ACLU t-shirts, because I like to end with something positive. I'm trying to motivate you to reclaim rights that have, have been lost uh, or cut back on. You all know from television, um, one of the rights in the Fifth Amendment that we looked at, you have the right to remain silent. But my favorite ACLU t-shirt talks about this other right, which isn't nearly as well known, but it's infinitely more important, and that is you have the right not to remain silent. So please exercise it. Is it, could, could I, I just, would like to ask a question with that's been bothering me and I have no answer to, but do, do most of you feel that the spending for politics is out of control? Is that a fair statement? And are you tired of the ads? Yes. And are you tired of the people to, you don't even know to put billions of dollars literally into a campaign uh, to, to influence what's going on? Me too. Uh, <laughs> And I guess my, my question is, is uh, and I'm in dangerous territory here, it's been a long time since I've been on the law review at the University of Michigan, but uh, in the Congress in the 70s, we wrote legislation that limited both the time you could campaign and the amount you could spend, and I believe the Supreme Court in U.S. versus Vallejo uh, turned that all around, and ever, ever since then, it, it, it goes on. When I went door to door, for 13 months in 30,000 homes, I think I raised $150,000 for three campaigns with it. That same race now would at least be 12 to $14 million in, in order to, to, to run today. And my question is, is the Supreme Court, is there a chance that they have in some other areas, is there a chance, is there something we can do or some way to, to, to get the Supreme Court to, to look at it? I guess the dissent in one of those cases was uh, in free speech that uh, that doesn't give you the right to yell fire in a theater. I believe, wasn't that a, the dissent? And let me tell you something. I think the money we're spending in our campaigns and what we're doing to our system is much more dangerous than fire in a movie theater. And I, I, I wish there was some way, maybe you both could comment on a, the idea, the thought of it, and B, is, is it just a hopeless dream to ever, to ever attack it that way? Because I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, truly, with this billions of dollars. Well, uh, Ladies first. <laughs> uh, I actually agree with the Supreme Court's decisions that are badly distorted uh, uh, by holding that money is speech. If you read the Supreme Court's decisions on that theme, they're much more nuanced, which is to say, in order to make your message effective to reach an audience in this era of mass communication, maybe somewhat less so with the internet, which is much less expensive, but certainly television advertising is incredibly expensive, you can have a theoretical right to speech, but if you can't get your message out to that audience, you are never going to have uh, a meaningful chance of being elected. So it would be as if to say, well, you student newspapers have a right to free speech, except we're not going to give you any money to buy the paper, to uh, buy the resources, to uh, hire the investigators, et cetera, that will give you a meaningful right to free speech. So uh, on principle, I believe very strongly that it would violate the First Amendment for uh, the government to tell certain entities that they may not spend money in order to advance political messages, because political messages are the most important 
for we the people to be able to receive in order to, or have the option of receiving, because we can always turn off the dial if we're sick of hearing those ads. Uh, but we also should have the right to choose to listen to those messages. I completely agree with Congressman Fry that there is a real problem in terms of people who are running for office ha or already in office having to spend such a huge amount of their time, which I see as our time, right? Because we the people elect them to represent us, uh, and they should be debating. Ninety percent, basically, of yeah, that today should, is, and, you is know, just raising money. Nothing else. Never couple, talking to anybody. A couple of the questions were, you know, why is it more? I'd rather that they were debating about the Constitution and you know, and federalism and and doing uh, serious work. So. Um, the ACLU has not only always opposed uh, spending and contribution limits as unconstitutional, we've also uh, made the argument, I th which I think is demonstrable, that they are ineffective. I mean, every law that's gotten more and more strict has just led to more and more loopholes, uh, which the Supreme Court has acknowledged that the so-called loopholes are inevitable because of the free speech principles. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, I think what we should do, what would be consistent with the Constitution and would actually work, is to have complete public financing of all ballot qualified candidates. Uh, the shocking thing is if you add up even the huge amounts of money that are being spent in elections now, it adds up to not very much for each of us, less than the advertising budgets of many major corporations. Um, uh, political science studies have also shown that in order to be elected, uh, it's not important what the ceiling is. In other words, that uh, though the person who spends the most isn't necessarily going to get elected, and we've seen many important examples of people who are far outspent still getting elected. But what is essential is that there's a certain floor of financing that you need to get your message out there. One other point that I have to make, which is, uh, with all due respect to mem many members of Congress, past and present. That's when you know a real <laughs> zinger is coming. <laughs> Shot at me next. Do, would you expect incumbents to pass a law that is genuinely going to make it harder for them, most incumbents, to pass a law that is genuinely going to make it harder for them to be reelected? Uh, the answer, given human nature, which James Madison, among others, recognized, and we have to recognize that, we do, should not expect people to make self-sacrifices, uh, the answer is no. And it's not surprising that every single one of these laws has been designed essentially as an incumbent's protection act, which is why I bristle at the term reform. Fi campaign finance reform, to me, is as distorted a description as USA Patriot Act and all of the others that, that we've talked about, uh, because reform, the idea, I totally support the idea behind it that animated it, which is we want to make it easier for more people to run for office, for more of us to participate in the political process, to be completely engaged, whether as candidates, whether as activists in campaigns, to have our voice heard in any way that we choose. But that is not the effect of these laws. These laws are really making it much harder for a challenger. Uh, to, to get the campaign off the ground. Let's get James Madison in uh, on this and uh, <laughs> hear what the, he, would, he, would, he, he would say. Uh, well, I, I think that you know, the, the um, uh, Citizens United case did divide the civil liberties community uh, probably more than any case in the history of the court. On one side, you had the traditional free speech coalition, which uh, actually opposed uh, the federal government's position in the case. Uh, the ACLU is part of that coalition. And then you had um, another group, which you can call the sort of good government coalition. And they're usually together. They're usually part of a civil rights movement, but they were divided in the case. And I actually did support, uh, I, tend to, I tend to be associated with the free speech side of those, and I did support um, uh, those uh, challenging the federal government, because I do view this as a speech issue. It's very hard 
uh, to put restrictions on corporations. What concerned me most about Citizens United is that you had an agency that had this movie on Hillary Clinton, and that agency said, okay, that's a political movie. That's restricted when you can run it. Uh, but then the question became, well, how about uh, it's these other movies uh, uh, dealing with George Bush, for example, uh, which uh, by Moore, were those viewed as campaign commercials? And it, it raises very serious problems for a civil libertarian to have a bureaucrat there that says, okay, well, that's a campaign movie. That's a legitimate uh, movie. That's not the role you want the United States government or any government to be in. And that's what bothered the free speech advocates. Um, my view on this is that there's a much more fundamental problem in this country. We are having a political crisis. Uh, our political system's broken. Uh, and we need to have a national debate about how to fix it. It is not a question just of financing. It goes far deeper than that. We need fundamental reforms. Uh, one of it is we need to break the hold of the two parties on our political system. Uh, the Republicans and Democrats have a monopoly on power, and it is causing untold damage to this country. Uh, those two parties, in my view, are functionally brain dead. And there is just no EEG showing uh, of any brain activity in either party. And I hate to speak harshly about this. It's not about individual members, but when you have a monopoly, First one. <laughs> yeah, when you have a monopoly of control by two parties, it strangles uh, a lot of these concerns and issues. You just basically have this echo chamber, and frankly, the same people are just reelecting themselves. Uh, it just, you know, the Democrats lost. To the Republicans, what happened? The very leaders that led the Democratic Party to that disaster immediately uh, were reelected uh, and put into leadership positions, people like Nancy Pelosi. Uh, those civil libertarians that were opposed to what the Democratic Party was doing have no say at all. Bro President Obama's example of that. You know, he ran on a civil liberties uh, platform and proceeded to roll back on an array of civil liberties and to expand on many of the policies that he criticized of George Bush. So we have a system that is detached from voters. Uh, over and over again, polls show voters don't like what the two parties are doing, but they have no say at all. The best example of that, in my view, that really summed this up, I don't know if you watch the Democratic National Convention. I have to watch because I'm a columnist, and I gotta tell you, it's, it's painful. Um, and I, but I watched the Democratic National Convention, Convention and I thought it was a really interesting moment because this year the delegates left out references to God and references to Jerusalem being the capital of Israel. Okay? I don't have a dog in that fight, quite frankly. I could care less what these conventions do because I don't really like either party very much. I, but I thought it was incredible when the the conservatives attacked the Democratic leadership saying, whoa, 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 you don't have God in the platform. Now, frankly, you know, it's, the Democratic Party is not a godless party, and it's, I, I don't know, uh, yeah, I thought it was all a bit silly, but um, what's fascinating is a lot of the delegates wanted a secular platform, okay? So the Democratic leadership said, no, 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 we want it back in the platform. So they bring up this, the, the, the issue. Uh, one of the former governors stands up and says, I hereby move for God to be put back into uh, the platform. I signal, signify by saying, you know, I. And it has to pass by two-thirds vote. Comes back, the nays have it. Okay? It's overwhelmingly nay. Okay? And he just stands there like a deer looking in the headlights of a car and goes, I, let's do it again. <laughs> Those in favor of a many say aye, nays have it, right? Overwhelmingly nay, okay? He stops, sort of sputters, is very close to saying it fails. And then he goes, let's do it for a third time. This time, it's enough to make his hair blow back. People going, nay! And he said, all right, the ayes have it. And to me, it was the ultimate symbol of what's wrong with both parties, is that the leadership doesn't care what the vote was. It, because they don't matter. The delegates don't matter. The, the, the voters don't matter. So the question is, how do we change that? And we have to change the political system. You can do it a couple ways. One, we need the Minnesota rule. We need to have a rule that the top vote-getters in any primary 
run in the general regardless of their party. Now, the reason that is necessary is because we have this control of incumbents, but it's largely because if you go to Sugar Land, Texas, they're going to elect a Republican, okay? And we've seen that, you know? We've seen members that have been indicted, okay? But they are so blue and they're so red that, you know, you could have a guy holding a duffel bag with seven severed heads in it, and he would still be elected to Congress because he's Republican or Democrat. The way you change that, pick the top vote getters. So it's not always a Republican Democrat. It might be two Republicans. But give the voters a choice as to who goes to Congress. Second, you need to break control of the two parties to allow greater participation in the ballots of third parties to break up their control. Third, you need to get rid of the Electoral College so that presidents actually campaign in all of the states. Right now, there's virtually no reason for Barack Obama to go to Utah, okay? And, you know, because he's not gonna win that state. The Electoral College, in my view, now uniformly produces bad results. And then, you know, there's an array of different other changes, but we need to have that debate to change the political system first. And that's a very long answer, but that's where I come out. I, I guess I have two questions. Uh, either of you can answer, but uh, I just like to put them out there. Now, with the renewal last year of the Patriot Act and also the establishment of the National Defense Authorization Act that you, Professor Strassen, mentioned, and also the recent attempt of uh, the passage of the SOPA Act, which almost tried to uh, really like, go strict copyright laws and censor the Internet, which, again, Professor Strassen, you mentioned trying to uh, eliminate at the very beginning of the Internet. Um, now, you've, both of you have said that a lot of voters are, are sort of unaware. Now, I guess this one sort of applies more to personal and civil liberties, which was the focus of Professor Strauss in your speech uh, to an extent. Um, do you believe, Professor Strauss, in that the, uh, it's more uh, socially irresponsible of the media, who are our sources to propagate such information to us, the public, to not really report on what affects us as people? And uh, I... And my separate question was uh, for Professor Turley. You mentioned teachers. Um, recently, a lot of schools, a lot of states have regulate, tried to regulate high school and middle school, elementary school curriculum to take away the, the, the creativity, which is just one of the very few last standing pillars of uh, teacher principles, and tried to tell them what to teach and how to teach it. Now, not only are teachers uh, underpaid and underbenefited, if that's even a word. Now, taking away their, their ability to teach as they feel they should teach, does this, are we not only devaluing uh, like ourselves personally through like the civil, civil liberties part, but are we also devaluing the beacons of, of uh, intellect and our chances to grow as people as well? Because... Let's keep the question short. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I'm really interested in what you're yeah. saying, but I think... I'll leave it at that. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your first name. Is it Ty? Ty. Well, I'll vote for you for president. That was a very, very eloquent, and you obviously are, are very well informed. Both of us could answer either question, but since you've uh, d d directed them, I'll, I'll answer the first one. Um, you obviously have managed to get information uh, despite socially irresponsible media. You won't be surprised that uh, as a defender of free speech, I defend the media right to cover as uh, poorly, uh, inaccurately, unwisely, unfairly. That's their freedom of speech right. But we really have an obligation. And thanks to the free, so far free, internet, uh, an easy opportunity to get our own information. So if you're interested in civil liberties, you would look at the ACLU website, you would read Jonathan's blogs and his columns and so forth. And uh, there's a wealth of information and a wealth of perspective out there. Um, in terms of uh, getting, and it has been effective. So a couple of the recently proposed internet censorship laws have been killed uh, by a broad coalition of business groups as well as uh, civil liberties groups, free speech groups, and so forth. So activism does have an impact and, and does occasionally at least overcome what had been strong bipartisan support in Congress until this uh, outpouring of organized opposition. Um, the opposition has to come in a way that members of Congress really feel 
feel the pinch, that they think that this is an issue that is significant enough to a broad enough swath of their constituents uh, that it's going to hurt them if they vote counter to, to the way people are expressing their viewpoints. And this is a, a positive that I want to say, despite the um, role, the uh, unappetizing role that raising and spending money has in our political process, I can say, having head, headed an organization that makes absolutely zero campaign contributions, it's against our mandate, as I explained, and yet has an enormous amount of influence on government all over the country through lobbying and uh, as well as through through litigating that you can have influence through and will have influence through your ideas through your votes through your writing of op-ed pieces and blogs uh, despite the attempt to perhaps to by the political system. My own experience is that that has not succeeded. Uh, and that's why I say, Ty, you know, you made a great speech here. I hope you'll make it as a candidate for uh, even higher office in the future. Um, I'll just add on the second note, um, I'm very concerned about what's happening uh, in secondary education. Uh, it seems to me that we are producing a, a generation of sheep uh, when you look at the range of restrictions being put on student speech, uh, the level of searches that are going on with students, drug testing, uh, the intolerance that is being shown for both teachers and students in expressing their views, uh, the zero tolerance policies, which have come, have really developed into zero thought, where people, students are being, you know, thrown out of school for bringing an aspirin, or, or you know, we had a case of a five-year-old that was tossed out for using a finger gun uh, because of zero tolerance. Uh, we had one student recently that was tossed out because he actually is deaf, and his name, his name is Hunter, which looks like a finger gun. And so his parents were brought in and said, he can't, he can't do that uh, because it looks like a gun. We have zero tolerance. And his, teacher said, his parents said, that's his name in sign language. And they said, change the name. Uh, don't have him say, have him go by a different name. Well, you look at all of these things, and it's, it, my concern is, look, look, there's always been stupid acts. Okay? There's lots of people that uh, may be prone to that. Uh, but... That's not a complaint. The complaint I have is high schools are where we shape citizens. And if we shape our citizens, high school students, to be afraid of expressing themselves, not able to write things in the student papers, subject to continual searches and seizures, and more importantly, arbitrary and indefensible policies, like these zero-tolerance policies, what type of citizens come out of that? What are their expectations for the government? What are their views of authority? They're not the citizens we need. And that's what I'm, I'm primarily concerned with. Uh, Mr. Turley, I, I was uh, wanting to comment on what you said about the Democratic uh, Convention. Um, I, I watched the video. I wasn't there. I would have loved to be there and probably get a laugh out of that. But um, what, what it seemed like happened in the video was that he expected people, everyone to unanimously say, I... But it turned out it like seemed even, so he did it again and again to be even. And at at the last one where he he just said I, and he he did it pretty straightforward and confident, making it sound like you know. When you when you got the gavel up here and and you can control the time and that you know you're going to use it, and that was just a great example of of uh, not bad politics, if you will. But you had the you had the authority. How many how many Republican Chairman, are there right now in the House of Representatives? Basically, all, right? Well, how many Democratic chairmen? Because they're pretty close in number, so I suppose they've got a proportionate number of the uh, vice chairman. No, no, they, they don't have any. You know, it's winner take all in the House of Representatives. If if you win by one vote, you controlled every bloody committee slot going. Fifty years the Democrats had it. I was there for ten years. Never, ever was in the majority. It's much better to have the gavel. Right. And uh, that's what I was saying. I was going to get to, yep. like, and I think they're supposed to, when it's even and they hear it even, they're supposed to take it to a vote. And he didn't, obviously. Well, it has to be by two-thirds. You have to have two-thirds eye. Right. So if it was close, it failed. 
Right, and, and if they're taking it to a vote, and they, they should take it to a vote. So, okay, I think we've killed that one pretty right, much. Right, are you saying that we should go straight to the vote and like ignore the unanimous, based on the bias what, that could be presented? I, I'm well, what, yeah, what I'm saying is that it clearly failed. The voice yeah, clearly failed. Right. So they had to go ahead and go to a vote. But what I thought was interesting was the view of the, le of the leadership that it didn't matter. It did, really didn't matter whether people That's were opposed or not. And that really says so much about our political system, that the voters are treated as sort of props, you know, that they, you know, all these, these politicians say, oh, it's a terrible thing that people don't vote, and yet they don't respect the voters. Right. And I have two quick questions. The first one is about education, because both of my parents are teachers, and it's something that hits close to home. And I want to know, especially here in Florida, mo sometimes our teachers are being scored or are being... Their, their jobs depend on how well students they do they do in a test in the FCAT for the for you know for as an example, and I was wondering how is it how do you expect how do the government expect teachers to actually teach students when their job depend on students actually passing that test? Our education is getting a, it's getting hit because of that. And my second question is referring to women and how the abortion. How is it that it, it's is it against or is it unconstitutional to completely say no to abortion, or is it a matter of 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 the um, of how of how, of the situation? As in, you have this one person who was raped and and is pregnant. Does she not have the right to say no? I want to take control of my life and I want to get an abortion. Thank you. Short answer. Okay, I'll try to be very short. Uh, on teachers, you're preaching to the converted because when I talked about the wonderful teachers I had early in my life, it wasn't because on some standardized test, you know, I got the right answers. It was because they were stimulating thought and discussion and debate and dialogue. Uh, also, we have the same problem in law schools because you may have heard law school graduates have to take this very scary test called the bar exam. And if we were to teach uh, students only in terms of, or if we were to be judged on how many of our students pass the bar exam, it would be so completely disconnected, probably obviously connected. Are we teaching them to think critically, to be effective lawyers, to advocate on behalf of their clients effectively? So it makes absolutely no sense from a teacher's or student's point of view. Um, and the second question about abortion rights, uh, one thing I wanted to say about the Constitution, those who oppose the right to abortion will often say, well, it's not there. That's not even an express right to privacy uh, in the Constitution. But you know what? The original unamended Constitution did not contain many articulated rights. Why? Because they were creating a charter of limited government. And the presumption was, unless the government was given the power to invade the right, then it didn't have that power in the first place. So uh, to sort of have an added safety net, there were uh, pressures to add an explicit bill of rights uh, that was sort of like, yeah, not only are we saying that Congress, the government doesn't have that power in the first place, but here we're really underscoring it by saying they really can't abridge freedom of speech. But some people were concerned because they said, well, but if we say that there are these certain rights that are protected, such as freedom of speech and religion and due process, uh, the ones that we've talked about, then doesn't that give rise to an argument that others that aren't there might not be protected, even though we want them to be, such as abortion? So to take care of that, they added the Ninth Amendment, which you should all look at. It says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So there's a very strong textual argument that the presumption is uh, that these fundamental rights integral to uh, our, our persons, our own moral code, our own religious beliefs, our own family choices, our own medical situations uh, should be retained by us and not made by any government official of any party. Uh, it remains to be seen whether the Supreme Court will continue to uphold that right uh, 
law. There's this very, very strong voice on the Supreme Court for overturning it. That said, states can still, exercising their federalism prerogative, pass laws that choose to protect a woman's right to choose, no pun intended, as a matter of state legislative choice. State constitutions can be sources of protection. So our rights don't stand or fall, thank goodness, on only what the Supreme Court holds. Uh, my question is for Professor Turley. I believe earlier you stated you were in favor of a national health care system. And I ask you for an entire speech that was about uh, the differences in between states. What about the differences between individuals and individual prosperity and prosperity within the marketplace? Well, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I, uh, Angela, can you articulate when you say what, what do you mean by differences between individuals? What are you asking me? Uh, I mean, what about for individuals who are able to provide themselves better health care? through a better company other than the government, that the government yeah. doesn't know best for them? Uh, first of all, um, to me, the, the, I think that the, the reason we need national health care is that the priority has to be those people who can't afford national health care need better health care, and we need to take pressure off emergency rooms, which have become the primary health care system for people who are uninsured. It's a system that makes no sense. It's a national problem. We need to tackle it. Now, the, the reason that we have the mandatory requirement for that 18-year-old in Richmond is that under the insurance program created by Congress, they need people like you to get insured because you're healthy. And quite frankly, you're not going to ask for any money back. So you're, it's sort of like the Social Security system. We need you to be insured so that we can be sick uh, and pay for us. And so there's an re economic reason for it. But I think it ties into this question of how far you're willing to go. Uh, you know, there's lots of things that we do that are bad decisions. And this goes to the sort of nanny uh, state debate. And that is, what, how far can the federal government go in saying you've got to make the right decision? Health care, I think, is a close question. But we've seen this expansion. You just saw with New York just passed the big gulp law that says that you can't buy a 16-ounce uh, sugary drink in New York. Uh, so what you do is you buy two 8-ounce ones. Or by the way, the 16-ounce, you can buy the 16-ounce if you pour alcohol in it because that's, alcoholic drinks are, are exempted, so they become healthier when you pour vodka in them. Um, but the point about, about Big Gulp and these other things is just the, the, the government always has really good ideas and they get really frustrated not always, but they often get frustrated when we don't do what they want us to do. Americans are getting fatter, okay? We're just, we're getting fatter, we're getting unhealthier, and I understand why people are upset with that. But part of, of living in a free world is the right to make bad choices. And you know what? It falls into sort of, you'll, you know, have to pry my dead cold fingers off my big gulp. Uh, because it, it really isn't about the drink. It's about the right to make the decision. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Give the panelists a chance.